Amen. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Bow your heads. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you once again this morning for the privilege to rally around the Word of God. We thank you for the Bible, 66 books of exceedingly great and precious promises, that by all of these promises we're made partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We thank you for the holy written word of God. Father, we thank you for the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, and all that he has provided and all that he did for us through the great plan of redemption. Thank you for his life of obedience in all points he was tempted as we were, yet without sin so that he could secure, deliver, protect us who are tempted. But Father, we thank you that before Jesus left the earth, he prayed to the Father to give us another comforter. And I'll give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither know him. But you promised us that we would know him for he dwells with us and shall be in us. And so we just trust the Holy Ghost this morning to help us. We trust the Holy Ghost this morning to lead us and to guide us into all truth. Thank you for the anointing which abides in us. We need not that any man teach us, but that same anointing will teach us all things and is true and cannot lie. So we make demands on the anointing in Jesus' name. Now, Father, I thank you that every heart will be strengthened, and blessed, and edified, built up, and established in those things that do pertain unto the kingdom of God and unto the name of Jesus. And we're so careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say amen. amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Well, good morning. We'll get right back in the Word of God, and I believe... We'll go a little further this morning. We're going to stay very, very close to Scripture. I got a lot to cover and don't know how far we're going to go, but we're going to just dive into the Word of God and see how far we go. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Uh, Acts chapter 4, we'll just read this verse again. I like to always start here and emphasize everything around these verses. Acts chapter 4, the prayer meeting here held after Peter and John was let go. They went to their own company. The Bible says uh, they began to pray. They lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God who has made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that therein is. And they commenced the praying in the 29th verse again and says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. And grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hands to heal, and that signs and wonders shall be wrought by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had pr prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he owned was his own, for they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land and houses, or houses, sold them and brought the price of the things which he sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now here we have a, a great, great uh, move of God going on. Some people would call it a revival, but it's actually not a revival. It's, it's just... Uh, is a result of a prayer meeting is great grace that has been uh, bestowed upon the church. Amen. Now, uh, we've been making comments, and I'll make a few comments every service so every service can stand on its own. Number one, we said that we are in the dispensation of grace. We talked about seven chronological dispensations in the Word of God. And uh, I carried you over to Ephesians chapter 3. Paul talked about this I uh, the dispensation of grace. Ephesians chapter 3, 
He said, uh, for if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God given unto me to you work, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, wherefore I wrote unto you in a few words that you may understand my knowledge in the, in the mystery. And so Paul said that uh, he was a steward or a, uh, a, a distributor or an, administ an administrator of the dispensation of grace. Now, uh, so this whole dispensation is categorized by grace. And it will end very, very graciously. 2013, we entered into a, a time of great grace. A time of great grace. Amen. And uh, great grace was upon the early church, and great grace will be upon uh, the finishing church. Amen. Now, um, when you say great grace, <clears throat> there's a lot of misunderstanding about grace and what it is and what it's not, but it's not a, a license to sin. Amen? Amen? Grace in its simplest form is, uh, there's a lot of acronyms and a lot of definitions of grace. I'll just quote a few. Uh, number one, uh, the most common definition of grace is um, unmerited at favor. Well, it is unmerited at favor, but it's not just unmerited at favor. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. And then uh, I remember Kent Fobb, he he uh, been in ministry over 30-some years. He uh, went to Rama in the uh, early, early 80s, and he teaches in our Bible school. He teaches a class called Grace and Law. He knows more about it than anybody I know. So uh, his definition of grace is God's giving. God's giving. So we sort of use that around our place and around our Bible school. Amen. Now, my definition of grace, and uh, it's a little bit different, but uh, there's an acronym of grace that says God's riches at Christ's expense. And that's exactly what it is. It's God's riches that came to you at Christ's expense. Amen. But I'd like, just like to sum all of that up and you know, just step out of the theological zone and just sum it all up for you. Maybe it'll, this will help you. I say that grace is everything. Everybody shout everything. everything. Grace is everything that God has provided for us through Christ Jesus. Grace is the Holy Spirit in you. Grace is the Holy Spirit upon you. Grace is the nine gifts of the Spirit. Grace is apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Grace is the name of Jesus. Grace is the holy written word of God. Amen. Grace is the exceedingly great and precious promises. Grace is everything. Everybody shout everything. everything. In fact, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, if you will, everybody. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> I could quote this, but I want you to get it. I want you to see it with your own eyes. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Hallelujah. And verse 7, it says, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? What hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why does thy glory as if thou hast not received it? In other words, uh, what do you have? Paul is asking the Corinthians a question. He says, what do you have? that you did not receive. You see, grace is God's giving. Amen? Say that out loud. Say, grace is, grace is God's, giving. God's giving. Well, God's giving what? Everything. For God so loved the world, he gave. He gave what? He gave Jesus. And so grace came to us through the personage of Jesus Christ. In him dwells all the fullness of the wealth of riches and knowledge in him. Everything that we need, could ever possibly want, is found in him. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For we are complete in him. Can you say amen? amen. And so grace has come to us. God has given us everything lavishly very liberal. He's given us, the Bible says in Second Peter, 
that he's given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And so grace is everything. Hallelujah. Now, uh, the Greek here, uh, the Greek word for grace, and we're going to stay very close to Scripture today, very close to the Word of God. The Greek definition for grace, if you had a strong, exhausted concordance, you would look up the word grace, it'll carry you to 5485 in the Strong's. And it's the Greek word charis, or some people say kiros. And um, it is the root word of all giftings. In anything that comes from God, that's the root word. In fact, the word gift is charisma, charisma, from the root word charis, which is grace. So that means that anything that you have, any giftings, any anointings that you have, come from God, graciously, graciously, amen. Charis is grace, charisma is gifts, charisma, charisma. And so then if you're flowing in the gift, then we say oftentimes you're very charismatic. You have been very graciously endowed with supernatural ability to do anything. Can you say amen to that? And so now uh, you look up all these words on grace, and this will help all of us because this is, this is actually what's going on in the church. And this is actually what's going on in your life. This is actually what's happening right now in your life. The word grace here, the word charis, means an act. Everybody say an act. Well, you see, if it's not an act, it's not grace. See, that means grace has to leave the personage. Grace has to come from somewhere, going somewhere. Amen. For God so loved the world. He didn't just sit in the heavens with his hands crossed and said, I love you, I love you, I love you. Oh, I love you. I love you so much. No, uh, uh, God's love moved him. The Bible said Jesus was moved with compassion. Can you say Amen. amen. The Lord dealt with me about the healing ministry and the teaching ministry, and uh, that's what primarily we do, we teaching ministry and healing ministry. But uh, he said to me in 1990 of January, he says, son, 1991 of January, he said, son, I don't heal people because they're sick. I heal them because I love them. Amen. And then he said, I don't teach people just because I was a good teacher. I taught the people because I love them. And he says, and any good teacher, don't ever put your teaching gift or your teaching ministry before people. Don't ever go around just trying to spurt off, spurt off and display knowledge. The Bible says Jesus was moved with compassion and he taught them. He taught them. He was moved with compassion and he healed their sick. And so love was always the motor and the motivation. And so he said to me that if, if uh, some men love their ministry, more than they do people. Some men love ministry more than they do people. And he said to me, always love people, son. Always put people first. For when you put people first and love people, you'll never be void of the anointing to meet their need. Can you say amen? And so Jesus was moved by love, motivated by love. For God so loved the world. It wasn't us loving God that brought Jesus the Bible says not that he loved, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Hallelujah. Now, I want to tell you something that would be kind of a shocking statement to you, but I didn't get born again because I loved the Lord. I didn't get saved because I loved Jesus. My, I was 16 years of age, and they told me uh, about hell, told me about heaven. didn't take a whole lot of sense to make that choice. They told me hell was hot and heaven was cool and hell was bad and heaven was good and they asked me did I want to go to the heaven or hell and I made the choice. I didn't get born again because I loved Jesus. I got born again because I didn't want to go to hell. How about you? Praise God. I didn't know much about the fellow Jesus. They told me what he did for me. Praise God. They told me what he did for me, so I just accept what he did for me. Amen. Now later on in life, I started to love him more. I started to love him more. Now, how come I started to love him more? I found out more about him. That's right. That's right. The Bible says that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge. In knowledge. You see, I had knowledge of him. I started to fall in love with Jesus when I found out what he actually done for me. Till then, I was enjoying the ride. Praise God, I don't have to go to hell. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's enough to shout on by itself. Now... 
So grace is an act of granted favor that leaves, see, the word leaves implies deposits. It leaves a divine influence upon the heart. Are you listening to me? Am I doing all right? Praise God. Uh, grace is an act of granted favor that leaves a divine influence on the heart. Say that out loud. Say grace, grace is an act, is an act. Of granted, of granted favor that leaves a divine influence, a divine influence on, the on the heart. You see, if it's grace, there is a deposit that comes from heaven and it originates on the heart and it leaves a divine influence there. You just know it's there all the time. I can feel it in there. Amen. That deposit has come from heaven. It left a deposit there. But everybody said, that's not all. That's not all. You see, if it's only in the heart, then it's not grace. Because grace in the heart has to be seen. All graces distributed it from heaven must be seen, felt, and felt, and spent. Hallelujah. If you can't feel it, it's not grace. If you can't tell it, it's not grace. If you can't feel it, it's not grace. God leaves a divine deposit, a divine influence on the human spirit, upon the human heart. Say amen if you can. Amen. Its reflections are, its reflections, I get all this from the Greek, didn't make any of it up. It says, its reflections are, it leaves a divine influence on the heart and its reflections on the life of the recipient. In other words, the one that's receiving the grace, there is a reflection that comes, there is a divine influence that comes in the heart, but it's reflecting. You see, it's sort of like the, uh, the sun, the light of the sun is shining all the time. The moon has no light of her own, but the sun gives light to the moon, and the moon's reflecting the light that it's receiving from the sun. Can you say amen? amen? You see, if you're getting anything from God, if anything is coming in your heart from God, that it should leave a, a reflection. People should see it. They should feel it. They should be able to tell it. Are you listening to yes. me? Yes. Now, I won't pause right there because I want to put some men right in here. There's a lot of people going around today putting tags on themselves where ministry is concerned. Well, I'm a prophet, and I'm an apostle, and I'm a, a, a this, and I'm a that, and that. You, you know, it's just movements. And, and, and uh, everybody, wants to, everybody wants to be something that they think is important or popular at the moment. But you see, the Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 18 verse, God has placed the members, everyone in the, in the body, as it has pleased him. Yeah. 27 verse says, now you are the members of the body of Christ. Now we are the members of the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And God has set the members in the church as it has pleased him. And so you don't make yourself things. You be what God has called you to be. Yes. Amen. Amen. Now, a lot of people say that they are teachers. Most people don't want to claim the office of the teacher. But you see, if you're called to teach, there should be some evidence of the grace of God on your life to do it. There should be something reflecting. Amen. We live in a society where uh, everything's distorted. Everything's confused. My wife and I used to go in restaurants and, and just sit down. I, I, you know, I sat with, uh, I'm like, uh, you know, Doc Holliday, John Wayne. I, I don't sit with my back to the door. I, I, you know, I find the exit, and that's where I sit. I, I want to see everything's coming in this joint and everything's leaving out of that joint. In fact, before I sit down, I go spy out the room, see who's in there. In case a riot, a fight, a fire, or whatever happened, I'm going to get out. Amen. And so I always set face in the door. I get to see everybody that come in. And very often something comes in and I just uh, I lean over and nudge my wife and I say, now don't look right now. 
I say, but Turner, when you can, look and tell me what is it. <laughs> uh, is that a man or is that a woman? I, I don't know. Nowadays, you don't know. Amen. I, I believe a man ought to look like a man. I believe a man ought to smell like a man. I believe a man ought to act like a man. I believe a woman ought to look like a woman. I believe a woman ought to smell like a woman. I believe a woman ought to act like a woman. Say amen to that. And so I don't know, you know, and I, I just lean over and look. Because, you see, there's not enough evidence showing. My God, if you got to wear a sign on your chest that says you're a man, it may not be enough evidence showing. There should be enough evidence showing. Amen. A woman shouldn't have to advertise herself as a woman. My God, God did enough. God, God did enough with the praise God. He did enough. The Bible says he built a woman. He built a woman. God did enough advertisement. I mean, it, it ought to be enough evidence showing. If you don't have enough evidence showing, something's wrong. Are you listening to me? And so if you say that you are something and nobody else can tell it, you might not be it. If you're the only one know that you're anointed, I wouldn't tell anybody that you are. Tell somebody else figure it out. Amen. If you're the only person know that you're an apostle, you may not be one. If you're the only person know that you're a teacher, you may not be one. Amen. There are certain biblical characteristics of a teacher. There are certain guidelines for an evangelist. If you don't meet the guidelines, just shut up. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. God will exalt you in due time. Romans chapter 1, you can turn over there and look at this. Romans chapter 1, and I believe it's verse 5. Romans chapter 1, I believe, verse 5. Hallelujah. Praise God. Talking about the grace of God. Romans chapter 1, verse 5. Paul said, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Now notice here he said we have received grace and apostleship. Some people just received apostleship and not the grace. I said some people received the apostleship, but they hadn't received the grace. In other words, they conferred an office upon themselves that God didn't sanction. You can put any label on an empty can. They say that they are something, but there's no evidence. There's no grace to validate it. There's nothing to back it up to validate it. Amen? When the Lord called me in the teaching ministry, he said, um, well, it was July 1984. He says, I've called you to the, teaching, to, the, to the office of the teacher. And then in 1989, he says, I've called you to be a teacher to the body of Christ. So see, he put something else on it. Teacher to the body of Christ. I never heard that before. I put that on the shelf. I never heard of a teacher to the body of Christ. And the Lord said to me, now there are local teachers and there are teachers to the body of Christ. Some men are called to teach locally and some men are called to teach the body. Amen. Now what did you do with that? I put that on the shelf. I didn't understand all that. 1989, I put that on the shelf. Well, I went to a minister's conference in November 1989, 25th, 26th, 27th. Brother Hagan was holding the minister's conference, 3405 North Cluster Road, Plano, Texas, pastored by Gerald Brooks. Amen. No sense of you looking for the church now. They moved since then. But anyway, I went to that minister's conference from Monday through to the Thursday. And um, I went to that conference supernaturally. The Lord provided the money. I got a personal invitation to go. Uh, you know, Charles Capps was there, and Ken Copeland, and Ed Dufresne, Jerry Savelle, and Happy Caldwell, and Jimmy Hester, and Bob Nichols, and Billy Brim, and Leroy Thompson, and, and it's about 400 of us and me. Uh, I thought I had uh, showed up at the wrong place. <laughs> I thought I hadn't gotten the wrong invitation. Yeah, I don't belong in here. <laughs> you know, I, I caught the wrong cab here. I, I don't belong in here with all these heavyweights. And, uh, but I went in there and sit and sit and sit and sit and sit and sit and sit. And I remember on uh, one uh, Thursday morning, Brother Hagin was uh, covering this topic that I'm covering. And he walked right down there, one, two, three, four sections of seat. I sat on the fourth section of seat, on about the fourth seat, one, two, three, four, about the fourth seat on the end of the fourth section. He came down that aisle. He got right down in front of me, and he said, now, there are local teachers, and there are teachers to the body of Christ. Some men are called to teach locally, and some men are called to teach the body of Christ. And then he walked on. And the Lord said, see there, see there, see there, see there. 
That's what I was trying to tell you. I knew you wouldn't believe me, so I had you sent up here so he could tell you I knew you'd believe him. Say amen. amen. Can you say amen? amen? And so I got it. I got it. I'm a little slow, but I got it. 